Good evening and thank you for joining me on this edition of The Exchange. I'm Khan Eiling. Themed 50 years of nationhood, taking stock, moving forward. The National Economic Outlook Conference 2008-2009 aims to evaluate the country's 50 years of policies that have underpinned the nation's development. The two-day conference, organized by the Malaysian Institute of Economic and Research, MIER, also targets to explore the way forward. Now, what lessons has Malaysia learned from its own policy successes and policy missteps? And more importantly, what social economic policies are needed to serve Malaysia better in the future. With me here to share their views on this are Professor Dato Dr. Mohammed Arif Abdul Karim, MIER Executive Director, Professor Dr. Wolfgang Kasper, Professor of Economics from University of New South Wales, Australia, and Dr. J.N. Manon, Principal Economist of Asian Development Bank. Great to have you gentlemen on the show. Nice. Right, now let's begin with um, uh, Professor Dato Dr. Arif. What transpired at the two-day conference? Well, it had uh, two components. Uh, uh, the first part was uh, about the global economic trends, mm -hmm. which was presented by, uh, uh, by someone from the International Monetary Fund. Right. And we had uh, uh, the Asian Development Bank to present the regional uh, trends and outlook. And that enabled um, MAER to, to present its uh, own national outlook using mm -hmm. those global and regional presentations as a backdrop. Uh, we were actually looking at uh, how the world economy and regional economies are trending and uh, where does Malaysia fit in, 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 in that uh, uh, trend. And we are actually looking at uh, 2008 scenarios and 2009 mm -hmm. outlook in a, in, a, in a very broad brush uh, manner. Uh, in addition to that, we were looking at a number of issues in this conference, uh, uh, very much uh, in line with the main theme of the conference because right. we are... Now so it's part of the celebration of the 50 years, 50 years of independence. Mm -hmm. So we, we took a, uh, uh, the various papers presented at the conference, uh, looked at uh, uh, the, the, the track record more or less during the last uh, 50 years and, uh, and looking at our milestones and looking at our achievements and uh, you know, what we did right, where policy mis uh, might have been taken and so on and so forth. Now, um, Dr. Ka uh, Professor Casper, I understand that you were a treasury advisor for the Malaysian government in the 70s. So can we get your views on the, po um, the 50 years of policies with the Malaysian government? Yes, it looks like a lifetime ago, the early 70s. Right. Um, I think uh, Malaysians have a lot to celebrate about mm -hmm. on the 50th birthday of sovereign economic and political management. Economic progress is very impressive. The hardware that you see installed in the Klang Valley and around the country mm -hmm. is fantastic. The country has not had civil war or any of the other major mishaps that have plagued so much of the third world. Congratulations. But some other countries have done better. Maybe that's not a concern. I'm only a visitor and I'm not telling Malaysians how happy they should be or how much more ambitious they might want to be. Mm -hmm. Take, for example, Korea. 50 years ago, uh, the Koreans were way behind in living standards, uh, behind Malaysia. Now, living standards are about double. The Taiwanese have about twice the living standards that, and productivity that Malaysians have achieved. So it's a matter of perspective. Right. And it's also a matter of uh, probably who you are in the country. Mm. If you live in Damansara Heights and shop in the Golden Mile, you have good reason to be very happy. If you live out in a kampong, your life opportunities may not be just as good. Uh, over to you, Dr. Menon. Um, I think the uh, last 50 years have uh, produced a tremendous development outcome for uh, all Malaysians. Right. Um, I think uh, living standards have improved sharply. Uh, poverty has been almost completely uh, addressed. Um, racial income inequalities have fallen somewhat, but um, there are other intra-racial uh, inequalities that are rising. Mm -hmm. But I think the lesson that comes out of all of this is that um, Malaysia's commitment to keeping an open trade and investment regime has allowed it a lot of leeway in addressing these redistributional uh, challenges uh, with income uh, that it's had to face. And um, also 
the pragmatism of uh, responding uh, with policy changes during periods of crisis, um, with the NDP replacing the NEP, for instance, mm -hmm. when Malaysia faced uh, difficulties in the mid-80s. Mid um, I think that's uh, something that should carry on to the future when they, uh, when they have to face new challenges coming up. All right, we'll take a very short break. Be right back after this. Don't go away. Welcome back. The exchange continues. Now, um, Professor Arif, what have we learned from our own policy successes as well as policy missteps? And as just Dr. Men just pointed out, I mean, the, the thing that we did right was really to keep our economy open. And outward looking export oriented strategy has actually paid very handsome mm -hmm. dividends. And of course, there are pitfalls as in the sense that you are vulnerable to external shocks and things like that. But we have managed to really, uh, uh, you know, ride over all those things and, uh, uh, you know, and still be, remain resilient. So mm -hmm. trade is our lifeblood. Foreign direct investment is the backbone of the Malaysian economy. Right. Our liberal policies, I think, have paid handsome dividends. And one of the main selling points of Malaysia has been policy consistency, policy predictability, you know, and policy coherence. I think that is something that we shouldn't lose, you know, and it's very, very important because what worked in the 70s and 80s and 90s may not work in, in, in the future. Okay. So I think this is something that, uh, something that we have done very successfully. We must hang on to that and, and, and proceed further. Right. You know, and I think we need to keep uh, our uh, uh, the, the, the transparency, uh, uh, governance, uh, accountability and those, those are the issues that I think that need to be to be addressed and there are some uh, you know uh, uh, shortfalls uh, in, in in those those areas but I think Malaysia has learned a lot of lessons from various crises that we have gone through we had a crisis in sometime in the 60s 62 and then we had one in 80, 80 85 and then we had one in uh, you know uh, uh, in uh, in 97 90 mm -hmm. in uh, 98 we also had one in actually in sometime in the mid-1970s right. during the first oil shock. But we have learned a lot of lessons. In that sense, to me, crisis are good because it, it, it actually forces you to we take a hard look at yourself and do it. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, Professor Casper, uh, what are perhaps some of the policies that have deterred foreign investors from coming into Malaysia? Well, first of all, lots of policies have attracted foreign investors yes. here and created jobs and brought knowledge. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, you cannot attract every foreign investor that roams the world to this country. And um, it depends on sensitivity to certain things. I think there are concerns with discrimination, mm -hmm. with uh, labor market regulations that world class industry is no longer prepared to uh, tolerate. Um, you need a lot of licenses to come to Malaysia, you, a lot of permits. That sometimes is an irritant to internationally mobile investors. But having said that, it's still a country that has attracted a lot of productive foreign investors and people once committed here are happy to produce here. You don't know how many foreign friends you have former engineers and people right. who spent creative years here and fondly remember mm -hmm. what could be achieved. But would you say, uh, Professor Menon, uh, Dr. Mandat, uh, would you say that deregulation is the way forward for Malaysia? Um, I think so. I think um, so far, uh, as Professor Aris just mentioned, the open trade investment regime has clearly worked in driving uh, the economy forward. It's been mm -hmm. the fuel in the engine of growth. Uh, um, now, I guess the focus needs to change from the external front uh, to dealing with um, within the border issues, um, in dealing with uh, investment in industries that so far have remained protected in one form or the other. Um, I think there has been a concerted drive to actually improve um, management and governance in a number of um, key sectors within the economy that are dominated by GLCs, but um, the market structures uh, have remained relatively unchanged. Mm -hmm. And until reforms are uh, speeded up uh, to allow a greater competition and entry, uh, they will remain a big barrier to 
new inflows of uh, investment as right. well as uh, domestic private investment. Now, having said that, um, Professor Arif, is Malaysia ready to open up completely? No, opening up completely, you know, how complete is complete is, is, is a debatable question. Okay. But I think we, we can open up a lot more than we have done uh, thus far. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, uh, the, the, the uh, Malaysia is uh, in the forefront of, uh, you know, uh, many, many negotiations mm -hmm. at the moment. And some of those things are actually in our own interest to do so. In fact, if you wanted to open up and liberalize, it's in our own interest to do so. Not, sometimes we seem to think that it's for, it in foreigners' interest. It is, it is not a, it's a positive sum game, it's not a negative sum game. When you open up, you are opening up to opportunities. And, and then uh, there are, you know, it's a win-win game in the sense that both sides, uh, you know, gain from this, uh, this opening up uh, process. You know, and in fact, foreign, inter foreign investors are not interested in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, so-called in, in incentives. We cannot compete with other countries in terms of incentives. I think we have got enough incentives. And foreigners are not in, interested in, in this kind of incentives. They, they look at incentives only as the icing on the cake. And they look at incentives as, as a compensation for disincentives. I think we've got to identify what are the disincentives and eliminate them. And, you know, and that's the way to go and compete uh, for this uh, scarce uh, FD, uh, FDI. And I think some references were made to some mm -hmm. of the regulations, some of the licensing systems, you know. And things like that which make it uh, difficult for foreigners to do business. I think we should identify those things, eliminate them instead of giving them, uh, you know, tax holidays and things like that. And we certainly have to do that in order to um, attract more FDI. It's from yes, coming. Certainly. All right, we'll take another very short break. The exchange will be right back after this. Don't go away. Thanks for staying with us. Now, uh, Professor Casper, how would the ongoing subprime crisis as well as the rising oil prices affect the Malaysian economy? Not terribly much in all likelihood. Uh, Asia has developed a growth momentum of its own. But uh, at the conference where we heard a lot of great confidence about the future, I sometimes felt that beware, there are down, uh, downside risks which can be quite considerable. Every now and then there are major crises happening when, for example, energy prices and food prices right. go through the ceiling, when share markets get very uncertain and go up and down mm -hmm. dramatically. And I cannot exclude that something like that might happen. All right. So, uh, Professor Arif, are we able to weather such shocks? Malaysia has successfully done that uh, kind of thing, but no two crises are the same. The crisis that is likely to take place in the near future, if there's going to be a recession mm -hmm. in the U.S., Will be a different kind of a crisis. In the in the past crisis, of course, we we had you know capital massive capital outflows, right. and by this time around, you may have uh, the opposite. A lot of capital inflows coming in. The last crisis, we had a uh, currency depreciating dramatically. This time around, it may end up with a currency appreciating very dramatically, and so on and so forth. So. The, the, the lessons we learned from previous crises can be helpful, but we don't expect the, the current future crisis to be in any way similar to what we have done before. But nonetheless, I think Malaysia will be able to, 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 to withstand that uh, kind of uh, uh, external pressures uh, you know, uh, better than some other economies in the region. Mm -hmm. In the sense that, you know, for example, Singapore is much more vulnerable right. to this kind of crisis because they, do, they have a very small domestic market, hardly any resources, completely open to, you know, international ups and downs and so on. But as Malaysia has its own natural resources as a fairly sizable domestic economy, Correct. and we have got a good macroeconomic management and, and with government, uh, you know, interventions to to stimulate the economy in the, ma in the Keynesian fashion, you know, through, through monetary, appropriate monetary policies, fiscal mm -hmm. policies, we may be able to sort of, uh, you know, cushion the, the, the impact a little bit. But of course, the uh, domestic market is not a substitute for, for, for global market. Right. In that sense, you know, we, we, we cannot completely insulate ourselves from such external shocks. But we may be able to minimize the pain that comes out of it. So, uh, Dr. Mannon, how should we gear up to compete in the global base? Um, I think uh, Malaysia at the moment is sort of uh, squeezed in between um, um, labor-intensive manufacturing mm -hmm. and moving up the technological ladder to the next level. Right. Um, and uh, this is going to have to be the future. Uh, China now.